Well, well, good evening. It's so good to have you here with us for the third instalment of our free series. Uh, when I first heard that about Jeff and his recent trip to the Philippines, I've got to say that I was a little bit annoyed at the strength of our own policy in international travel and COVID-19. Apparently now I have skin in the game. So unfortunately for me, um, benching Jeff has taken a wrecking ball to my planned schedule both for this week and next. Uh, initially, I've got to say I wasn't a happy camper when I heard that news. But I sense that as I complained to God, and I did, uh, I sense that this was a message that needs to come from me. And I don't know what, but there is something going on with this particular message. Almost as soon as Jeff became unavailable, I began to come down with a little uh, man cold. And um, don't worry, the doctor has given me the all clear, all right? So I'm all good to come. But I don't want any of you to get my man cold. So after the service, I probably won't be out shaking hands with you. little recap of where we've been. In the first week, we talked about mammon and uh, the personification of wealth. The idea that mammon is a little g-god and it dominates the landscape in our culture. And we asked the question, do I have a money problem or do I have a mammon problem? So the idea that money has godlike status to produce joy and peace and even a sense of security is a mammon problem. It's not a money problem. And if you think that all that you own is somehow earned or deserved uh, rather than bestowed and given by God, then you have a mammon problem, not a money problem. And if you think that you can spend or save your way to happiness or to peace or security, then you have a mammon problem, not a money problem. Last week, Bill elaborated on this with the concept that godliness with contentment is great gain. And he presented us with this idea that the antidote to greed is to become a generous person. And that, that actually really makes sense, particularly when you look at the definition. So greed is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as a selfish and excessive desire for more of something such as money than is needed. And the very same dictionary defines generous as liberal in giving or open-handed. So how's that for a contrast? Greed is tight-fisted and tries to hang on. Generosity is open-handed and giving. Greed's never satisfied. It's always grabbing for more. And generosity is liberal in its giving and always giving more. So grabbing or giving, which one best describes you. And I reckon if most of us are totally honest about this, most of us will oscillate between the two. One minute we're giving and our hands are open, and the next we're grabbing and our hands become tight-fisted and becomes about what we can get rather than what we can give, or what we can keep rather than what we can give. <clears throat> I reckon the biggest issue for most of us is that we don't want to be greedy. I don't think anyone aspires to that. But we're saturated in this mammon-driven culture that those last three words of the greedy definition uh, are something that are a problem. So uh, more of something than is needed. And I reckon that's kind of where we get ourselves into trouble. That last word, need. You know, we, uh, we use that word a lot. I reckon we overuse it. So I need a coffee. I need to buy a house. I need more superannuation I need a new car. I need a new phone. Now, none of you will have ever said that, I'm sure. But I need a new phone. Uh, I need a new car. I need a new wardrobe. I need a new number one wood so that I can beat Matt Wanstall off the tee in a couple of weeks. I need new pants. I need a new dress. I probably don't need a new dress. But some people say that, right? I need new shoes. Have you noticed how that word need is nearly always followed by new in our mammon-driven culture? And how many times have you ever heard anyone say, I need an old car, I need a second-hand phone, I need some old clothes? 
Last, the passage that Bill talked about last week has Paul saying that if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. And I reckon a reasonable question would be to ask, will we? Will we be content with that? Probably not. The single greatest enemy to our giving is our hoarding. And whether we're hoarding money for security or whether we continue to buy things that we need for our security... Uh, Joanne, my wife, was watching a lady on the news buying up a tonne of toilet paper. And uh, the journalist asked her, why are you doing this? Why is this? Why are you doing this? And her answer was telling. She said, I saw everyone else doing it, so I thought I should. Now, that's a well-thought-out response, isn't it? We're, we even have a word for it now, FOMO, fear of missing out, right? We don't want to miss out, so we, we cling to these things. I heard a psychologist talking about why, why people need to buy excessive amounts of toilet paper and other goods right now. He said, we feel like we need to have control. So when people can't control COVID-19 or the potential of a pandemic, they gravitate to things that they can control, like not running out of toilet paper. So they buy to excess to manage their fear. And we all do it. Often we'll use money as a way to offset our fear and to get a sense of control and coverage over things that we're worried about. It doesn't say a lot about our culture that, and who the little G God is here, that people think they can buy control and maybe peace with it in the toilet paper aisle of their supermarket, grabbing for a semblance of control. Grabbing for a semblance of peace. Surely there's a better way. And we know that if we're to be honest, nine times out of ten, our needs are really wants. And if we know that giving is the antidote to grabbing, then the science is, is actually done. We know for a fact that generosity increases our well-being, for instance, and that it's been scientifically proven that it's psychologically and physiologically more blessed to give than it is to receive. The giver literally gets more out of the exchange than the receiver. Um, the generosity is a, an awesome practice to get into for your well-being as well. So how can we do this responsibly? How can we become less tight-fisted and more open-handed with what we have? How can we be generous and still have enough to get by. This week we're going to look at an ancient practice that precedes Mosaic Old Testament law. And it, it, this practice can actually help us to learn to have open hands in a planned and thoughtful manner and in accordance with our means. An ancient way that can be a foundational beginning for generosity in our lives. Before we do this, though, I want to pray because I reckon for lots of us, there's lots of barriers when it comes to talking about money and particularly when it, talks, when it comes to talking about giving. So we're going to pray right now and then we'll uh, get into it. Lord, we just ask that tonight uh, that you'd penetrate the tiredness for some of us, but you'd penetrate the barriers we put in place to being generous people. We ask that you'd speak to each one of us where we're at. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, when I was a, a little kid, uh, I know that you'll find this difficult to believe, but when I was a little kid, I was very short. Uh, I, I know. Shocking, right? How did, I must have had a giant growth spurt. Uh, anyway, when I was a, a little kid, I was very short, and my older siblings had bikes, but they were adult bikes, and I was a little fella, and their bikes were too big for me to ride. So... One day, we visited some friends in the country in a town nearby, and this family had little bikes, and uh, they encouraged me uh, to hop on their little bikes and give it a go. So on these bikes, if I sat on the seat, I could still reach the ground, which was amazing for me as a kid. So at first, I scooted along, and then I put my feet on the pedals, and away I went. Because the size of the bike suited me, it enabled me to learn to ride. And when I got home, I began to ride my siblings' much larger bikes on which I couldn't even sit on the seat and touch the pedals. I just would stand up and, and ride them. The small bike, though, enabled the adventures on the large bike. 
Tithe or tithing is one of the most brilliant on-ramps I've ever come across to learning how to be a generous person. So today I'm going to park on this ingenious custom-built technology for teaching generosity. Tithing is like training wheels for real generosity. It's a great place to begin, a beginner's on-ramp. It's means-tested, but it still requires faith. It is above and beyond Old Testament law, and it's one of the easiest roads to learning how to be a truly generous person. So before we begin, let me make a little disclaimer. Let me give you the good news. Even though Jesus endorsed the Pharisees' tithing whilst condemning their lack of mercy and justice, Jesus never once told his followers that they must tithe. Isn't that great news for everybody? So we all go, terrific, what are we even having this conversation for, Chris? Well, the, the, there is other news, not just good news. Uh, for those who are breathing a sigh of relief, let me give you the not so good news. Jesus never once told his followers to tithe, but the cost was often much, much higher than that. Much, much higher than 10%. When Jesus told the disciples that it's harder for a rich person, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, uh, that for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, they were incredulous. Have a look at what Peter says. Peter speaks up after this and he says, We have left everything to follow you. And again and again, Jesus moves those who wish to follow him towards total freefall financially. It's a very, very common theme in his teachings. So Jesus calls many of us to far more than 10%, and we're going to look at that next week. So fasten your seatbelts. This week, we're going to look at the on-ramp. So the easiest way in to the idea of generosity. The tithe is a precursor, if you like, a warmer upper. Needless to say, Jesus never spoke to his disciples about percentages. For Jesus, the conversation around money was always about lordship. It was always about who's the boss. Remember, you cannot serve both God and mammon. So it's about who's the boss of your life. And that's who Jesus is talking about. Because tithe is the best and most prolifically utilized understanding in Scripture of how to begin the generosity journey, it's the one that we're going to utilize today. And whilst the percentage can be burdensome for some, for most of us, it's a really clever and brilliant way to begin the generosity journey. So, disclaimer, if you have children and you ha are not able to buy food or shelter for them or yourself, you probably, uh, and, and, you're, and you're trying to meet some arbitrary percentage, that's probably not right. I would suggest you review that. Good giving, as we shall see, is not about rules. It's neither, neither is it a knee-jerk reaction, nor is it done under compulsion but rather good giving is a gift. It's an invitation to participate in God's kingdom in the here and now. So purely as an on-ramp to generosity, we're going to use the tithe pathway. Probably a good place to start is answering the question that's on all of our minds, what on earth is the tithe? Well, the tithe, tithe is a Hebrew word coming from Mahasa, and it's literally one-tenth or 10% is, is what it is. That's what it literally means. It appears 33 times throughout Scripture, mainly because it's a very narrow term that defines measurement. When the tithe is spoken, it's usually used to rule out confusion about what the minimum amount is. It's usually used in conjunction with another word, minna, or offering, or uh, gift, or tribute to God. And offering shows up 689 times in Scripture, just in case you're wondering. The idea of tithes and offerings are deeply embedded in people of God over many, many years. It's not a new idea. It's important to remember that you can't tithe 8%. You can't tithe 12%. The meaning of the word is 10%. So if you say, look, I tithe 12% of my income, what you're saying is I 10%, 12% of my... doesn't make sense, right? That's what the word actually means. It's important to remember that. And if you look at what the Bible says about this tithe, you could probably say something like this. The practice, tithing is the practice of returning a tenth of one's income, including assets of every kind, e.g. property, crops, livestock, as an offering 
to God. So the practice of tithing is not part of the old covenant law. It actually precedes Moses. Abraham gave 10% of his spoils of war to the priest Melchizedek. And here's another example of the word mahasa or tithe before Moses and the law. It happens when God comes to Jacob at Bethel. Jacob has this dream and God says to Jacob, mate, you are going to multiply and your descendants are going to be like the dust on the ground. It is going to be an amazing future for you. And Jacob's response to that when he wakes up from his dream, this is how Jacob responds to God's promise of blessing over him. When Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I'm taking and give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so no mention of a mobile phone or car, so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I'll give you a tenth. So it's, it's almost a heart response of thanksgiving. You see that? It needs to be said that even before the law of Moses, tithe was an expression of thanksgiving to God for his provision. So if God's with me and watches over me, gives me food and clothes to wear, because of God's provision, I will. So without Mosaic law, without Jesus, Jacob's response is to give a tenth of all he owns. And his tithe is purely out of thanksgiving. That's why he gives, because he's thankful to God for his provision and promise. It's not out of compulsion, and it's not out of the law. I want to be clear here this evening, tithe is not so much a rule as an ancient practice of thanksgiving, and it's an act of faith. It's a bit like Sabbath, so it precedes the law. Tithe is a tangible way of saying to God, you are the source of my income. You are the source of all provision for me. Do you believe that this evening? I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. Mammon is in control. Thanksgiving leaves the building and fear takes over. Rather than saying, thank you God for all I have and giving freely back to God as an expression of thanks, Mammon tells us we don't have enough to give away and that we need to trust our bank account our super account, our pay packet, our assets to meet our needs. Mammon tells us that we don't have enough. And importantly, Mammon also tells us that God is not enough to meet our needs. Many of us are enslaved by a scarcity mindset and we don't even know it. We are among the wealthiest people in the world. But many of us feel like we need more to get by. So rather than prayers and actions of thanksgiving, we're often enmeshed in praying for more. And lots of us make this kind of deal with God. I'll tell you what, God, if you give me more, then I'll give more. Now, if you're not giving 10% on a dollar, you're not giving 10% on $100. You know as well as I do that that scarcity mindset will follow you. We have food and clothing and shelter in abundance, but what do we focus on? Do we focus on what we have or what we want? I reckon it's the second one most of the time. When I first got my car, uh, I was delighted that it had Bluetooth and uh, a nice big screen and everything. And I was delighted until I saw another car with this thing called Android Auto. And it has a capacity to not only take and make calls, but to copy the entire phone onto the car screen. Songs, mapping, media, brilliant. All of a sudden, the bar for what was good went up, just straight away. As soon as I saw it, I thought, hmm, I think I'd like that kind, thanks. That's a scarcity mindset, right? That's a scarcity mindset. There's no room for thanksgiving in that kind of mindset. A lack of gratitude and endless need for more. And our country is absolutely saturated in this mindset. We have a world-class medical help for anyone who needs it. This is one of the only countries in the world you can have no money at all, walk into an emergency and get top class medical care. It's the only country, one of the only countries in the world you can do that. But what do we do? We complain about the amount of people in emergency rooms. We complain about it and we tell ourselves we'll be thankful when they're less crowded. That's a scarcity mindset. It's where there's no room for thanksgiving. So 
So most people in this room have solid housing options, most of us do. Whether we rent or have a mortgage, uh, we should be deeply thankful. But we tell ourselves we'll be more thankful when we paid off our mortgage or we found a place of our own. That's a scarcity mindset where there's no room for thanksgiving. When was the last time you went home and tucked yourself into bed and lay in bed and went, thank you God for a warm bed, for a roof over my head. A lot of us don't do it. We just, it just completely passes our minds. We don't even think of that as a gift. It's a gift. But our scarcity mindset blinds us to it. I said the other week that we have more access to money than the vast majority of people in the world, but I don't know too many people who are satisfied with what they have. Most people want more. It's a scarcity mindset where there's no room for thanksgiving. This scarcity mindset or sense that we'll never have enough can rob us of our joy, and it can take a wrecking ball to our sense of gratitude. So tithe stops this mindset of scarcity dead in its tracks. It gives us a practical mechanism to help break the thinking that we'll never have enough. So tithe right off the top. Uh, tithe recognises God as provider and it reminds us that we are recipients of his material grace, his blessings. So tithe uses, utilises generosity to combat greed, giving to combat grabbing, and it does it by reducing our means straight up by 10%. Straight away, you're taking what you've got and reduced it by 10%. And that's a, that's a big slap in the chops to mammon. It's a great way to do it. So it's a step of faith in God. But more importantly, it shifts our mindsets from earning to provision. So when we're earning, it's all about us and what we get. When it's provision, it's actually all about God and what he gives. So we're so distorted in our mammon-saturated culture that many of us think that we are the sum total of what we earn and we think that somehow it's our merit that enables us to earn what we earn. So lots of us think we have this sort of uh, idea that we deserve it. We tell ourselves that we work hard, and maybe we do, and, but there are people in third world countries that are smarter than you and work harder than you and me and they don't get paid anywhere near what we get paid. They'll never have access to the opportunities that we have. Why? Because they, don't, they just don't have those opportunities. None of us chose where we were born. But for whatever reason, if you were born or you live in this country, you've got access to opportunities that other people can only ever dream of. So whether we like it or not and whether we acknowledge it or not, all that we have is given. Every single thing we have has been given as a gift from God. So gratitude is the appropriate response, folks. We shouldn't feel guilty about it. I'm not saying we should go home and beat ourselves up because we have access to these things. We shouldn't feel guilty about it. But we should be grateful for it, don't you think? We should be actually thanking God for it. Well... Uh, when we tithe, we acknowledge that all that we have is not our own. One of the beautiful things and gifts of the tithe is it enables us to acknowledge that it's not from us. So like Jacob, we're simply thanking God uh, as an expression of our thanksgiving for the blessings that he's bestowed on us. So God gives us 100% and we return 10% out of thanksgiving. That's a pretty good deal where I come from. So let's talk about what the purpose of the tithe was. The purpose of the tithe, certainly in Old Testament times, was to celebrate the abundance of God's provision. It was also to meet the material needs of the priests and the temple. So that's how they ran it. Uh, using the tithe would help to do that. But also, it was to enable the religious community to provide for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. You know what? That, that actually still works. That all still applies. We're still thankful to God. It meets the material needs of uh, the church. It enables us, as Sindal Baptist Church, to actually minister to all sorts of people who are in need. This church is awesome at that. We do it both here in Waverley and beyond. We do it overseas as well. We're able to actually bless others as a result 
of the generosity of our people. So Sindal Baptist Church, our past, present and future, has, is and will be very much in the hands of its people. The place tithes and offerings have always been collected is in the place where the people gather. And for Sindal, it's here. In, it was the temple in Old Testament times. It was the church in New Testament times. In this time, uh, for us, for our community, it's Sindal Baptist Church. The beauty of giving to your church is that others are given responsibility for distribution. Once you've given, it's actually in the church's hands. And in this church, you'll be pleased to know I'm not the one who makes all the decisions there. You get a say as to who the people are. You elect our church council. You get a say as to how the funds are distributed. You vote on the budget. At the end of the day, Sindel can only be as generous as its people. We're absolutely pegged. To, our, to individuals in our congregation, we're pegged to that. The condition of our budget as a community says a lot about who we are and where our allegiance is and where our passion is. It's just like a, it's like a little gauge that tells us how we're going with Jesus and how we're going with mammon. And I've got to say, as the senior pastor, at this time, we're not going real well. We, we, we need to do better than what we're doing. But that's a conversation with Jesus. Unfortunately, uh, we generous is one of our values here at Sindel Baptist Church, but unfortunately it's just a word on a wall at the moment. And whilst it's true for some of us in our giving, according to our budget, it's not true for most of us. If your treasure tracker, the thing that we gave you in the first week, is being filled out and you want to know what's most important to you, look under the giving section. Have a little look under that and it'll tell you a lot about who's master, and it'll tell you a lot about what's most important to you. Randy Elkhorn says it well. He says, I'm not saying it's easy to give. I'm saying that there are, and there are thousands who agree, that it's much easier to live on 90% or 50% or 10% of your income inside the will of God than it is to live on 100% outside God's will. Let me say it again. Jesus did not give a percentage. And from what I can see, if he did, it would be a lot higher than 10%. For whatever reason, the invitation in the New Testament is more related to your love for God than it is to a percentage point. So in 1 Corinthians 16, and in lots of passages like it, Paul says, Now about the collection of the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatians churches to do. On the first day of every week, one, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So it's pretty orderly. So all we can say from this and other scriptures like it is that giving for the people of God should be regular. So it should be something that we put into our normal schedules, our normal way of being. When I get paid, first thing to come out, even before my mortgage, is my offering. So secondly, it should be in keeping with income. You need to be smart about it. You need to think about it. You need to make sure that your giving is not spending beyond your means either. So that's why it's good to look at all of our spending in relation to our giving. And thirdly, it should be planned. Plan it out. The best kind of giving is always planned. We're going to explore this more next week uh, because it helps us all to be more responsible more thoughtful about who and what we give to. Giving should never be a knee-jerk reaction. We should think about it. We should pray about it. We should know what our priorities are. I think Paul, like Jesus, doesn't give a percentage because like Jesus, Paul doesn't want to put a ceiling on your generosity. The Old Testament gives uh, between a 10 and 23% cap. So it goes up to 23% if you add up all the offerings and tithes and bits and bobs. Uh, Jesus gives no cap. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't he terrific? He gives no cap. He's not, he's not capping off your generosity. He's saying, you can give it all. Isn't that wonderful of him to give no cap like that? And more often than not, he re encourages radical giving, particularly for the wealthy. So God made us in his image and he's generous and so should we be. The beauty of beginning the generosity road with the tithe is that as a percentage of income, it's means tested. 
So if you earn $100, it's only $10. If you earn uh, $1,000, it's only $100, and so on and so forth. Tithe is a great on-ramp. Now, for a few of our number, it might feel like you've got nothing to give, all right? I recognize that right here. I'd encourage you to talk to Jesus about what in accordance with your income actually means. So it might mean you start at 1% or even less for you. It might be that that's where it's at for you right now. But start the road. Just because you can't hit the 10% doesn't mean you shouldn't start the road. At least step onto the road. It's okay. Who knows? Maybe that's why Jesus didn't give a percentage to allow leeway. There are others among us, though, for whom 10% is not even close to a stretch. We do it, and we do it easily. For you, it might mean that Jesus wants to lift the ceiling so that your much offsets a less fortunate person's little. Who knows? That might be why Jesus didn't give a percentage. My encouragement is to be in conversation with Jesus about where he would like your giving to be. And if it's all too confusing, just begin with 10%. Start right there. Begin on the ancient path. Begin with 10% as a benchmark mark practice. The reason I'm so passionate about this ancient path is because it's been an on-ramp for me in my ongoing conversation with Jesus about money. I was taught from as early as I can remember to give 10%. I get given a dollar, I give 10 cents back to God. In, in those days, there was 10 cent pieces, like in the good old days, way back. In my early teens, when I was earning $7 pocket money, I decided to give $2 to God because I wanted to go above and beyond. Even in my early teens, I wanted to give God more than 10%. That was my heart. I thought it was a pretty good deal that he gave me 100% and only asked for 10% back. So I wanted to show him where my heart was in relation to money. When I started work, I, start, I got paid in cash and uh, I kept my tithe in a little tin that I called a tithe tin. And uh, it's original, huh? And I started borrowing from my tithe tin to pay some of my bills. Had a couple of big bills come in and my tithe tin was the most cashed up tin in the house. So I borrowed it, wrote some IOUs, you know, like Dumb and Dumber, wrote some IOUs and put them in the tithe tin. Well, after a while, the IOUs were far more than the cash in the tithe tin, and uh, I was struggling to pay it back. And in conversation with God, I'll never forget him clearing the debt and saying to me, Chris, this is not about you paying. You can never pay me back. I want to clear that debt. And let's start again. It's not about law. And I remember really clearly the sense I got was, Chris, I don't want your money. I want your heart. And if there's any principle that changed my giving practices, it has to be that. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't. But he wants your heart. And many times if we're to be honest in the culture that we live in, One of the really good signs that he has our heart is that we begin to have an open hand with our money as well. I've never not tithed since that time. And God in his grace has helped me move into a new understanding about giving. And we've been in conversation ever since. And I want to say to you here tonight, it's never too late to change. It's never too late to move into a new way of thinking about money. So next week, we're going to move beyond the ordinary tithe concept, and we're going to talk a little bit more about a Jesus-centered framework for giving. And trust me, his framework is a lot scarier than tithe. Trust me on this. But you've got to start somewhere, right? So let's start on that little easy on-ramp. I've got one question for you to consider this week as we prepare our hearts for next week, and it's going to mess with you, so beware. Uh, And the question is, How can I reflect my love for God more in my finances? Really simple question. How can I reflect my love for God more in my finances? So would there need to be a change in your spending or saving practices? Would there need to be a change in your giving practices? 
If giving doesn't feature in your budget, it's probably time to talk to Jesus about that. Have a conversation with him. If you're part of this community and your giving doesn't include Sindel Baptist Church and you belong here, then you need to talk to Jesus about that and talk to him about what, what that is. So next week we're going to talk about a more radical giving and faith-based giving, how to step into a, a different, uh, different way of thinking about that. So next week I'm going to call you to make a, a move and write a figure down. I'm not going to wave them around and, and read them out up the front here or anything, but I'm going to get you to write some stuff down before God. Next week we're going to do that. But this week is a week of listening. So this week... I want you to spend some time asking Jesus to help integrate your spiritual life with your financial life. Because I think most of us have two lives on this. I think we have a finance life which we keep to ourselves and we like to manage. Thank you very much. And we have a Jesus life which we're okay to talk about that but he's not to touch it. So I want want you to have a prayer about how you can more integrate faith into your finances. So we're going to do that right now and then you can pray that stuff for the rest of the week. Let's pray together. So Lord, I just ask that you would help us. Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds in our mammon-saturated culture. Help us to begin to see what you would like to say about our finances and how we handle them. Help us to become generous people, God. I just ask that you would give us the faith and the will to become remarkably generous people. And I ask, Lord, that you'd help us to do that individually. And I ask that you'd help us to do that as a church. Help us to integrate our spiritual lives with our financial lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.